Welcome, precious Holy Spirit. We know you didn't go anywhere. We brought you with us. And here we are. Thank you. You know our name, man. Just that. Just that alone. <laughs> Take us through this next week. You know our name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Linda and Daryl. Good to have you with us. I see you in. A number of people don't say anything in the chat, so I, I can't greet you. Tammy, good to have you with us. Thank you for being there. Uh, part four, face to face with the divine. When you talk about the presence of God, the Hebrew word for presence means face to face. We've been and are right now face to face with God. He doesn't go somewhere. When we finish and turn all the lights off and the cameras and stuff, we continue the rest of this day and all next week, we continue face to face with God, with Jesus, with Holy Spirit. There's a foundational passage found in John's Gospel, chapter 6, where Jesus really takes what he's done and talked about thus far and flips it on its head. In fact, the conversation that he has in chapter 6 makes the religious leaders of his day so angry that they want to kill him and makes his own followers so upset and unable to process his words that many of them stop following. They are difficult words. He talks about himself as the bread of life, which is a throwback to the Old Testament and the fact that they, God gave them manna, the children of Israel, when they were making their way through the wilderness. And they had no provision. God gave them manna, provision. But it wasn't transformational. So Jesus springboarding off of that, introduces himself as the bread of life. And then he takes it to a whole other place and he talks about it from the standpoint of consuming his flesh and his blood and says these are essential to eternal life. Let's read that passage. Carrie, grab your Bible or your iPad or whatever you use. What Carrie's going to be reading is from the Mirror Translation, so it may be difficult actually to follow along in another translation. But if you want to mark it in your Bible, John chapter 6, Carrie's going to begin reading in verse 46. No one has seen the Father except the one who proceeds from him. He is most intimately acquainted with the Father. Of absolute certainty do I declare to you that anyone whose faith ultimately rests in who I really am is the one the life of ages resonates. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and died there in the wilderness. This, which you have here in me, standing face to face with you, is the very sustenance of your life, the bread descending out of the heavenly sphere for everyone to eat their fill and not die. I am the living bread. I stepped out of heavenly realm into the earth suit and the incarnation so that everyone may feast on the idea of their true incarnate identity mirrored in me and discovered the life of ages incarnate in them. 
the bread that I will give is my own flesh. It will translate into life for the entire cosmos. This brought about a war of words among the Jews. How can this man give us human flesh to eat? Amen, amen, I say unto you that you have no real life in yourselves until you consume the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Your every meal is a celebration of the Incarnation. To eat my flesh and drink my blood is to digest me like your body is digested, to digest food as it becomes flesh. This echoes the life of the ages and communicates the fact that you are co-risen with me and the final conclusion of my work and redemption. My flesh is food in its truest form and my blood is drink in its truest form. The eating of my flesh and drinking of my blood is the celebration of our seamless union. You and me and I and you because you won't find you until you find me. Thoughts eat words like your mouths eat food and both become flesh. As the living Father has sent me and also sustains me, so will I sustain the one eating me. I live through my Father, just like my daily food sustains me, so his life permanently resides in me. Now you may also continually and habitually feast on me and live through me. This is the bread that stepped down out of the heavenly sphere. There is no comparison with the manna your Father receives from heaven, which was merely a prophetic shadow pointing to me. They ate and they died without completing their destiny. Now feast on me and celebrate the life of the ages. Thank you, Carrie. What was in the old pointed to the new. The manna was just a prophetic indication of something to come. Jesus the true bread of life. He begins this passage that we've read by saying that he's one with the Father. That's the Greek word para. It means intimate connection with. Jesus said this in John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. God acts just like Jesus. And that's why when you read difficult passages in the Old Testament about things that God does and the way God behaves, and you see that contrasted with Jesus, you know that that passage needs some understanding, interpretation, and exegesis. Because God doesn't do anything that doesn't look like Jesus. I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus then is the revelation of God's purpose, God's will. We know God through Jesus. And we're invited not just to know about God, we're invited to experience God. You know there's a difference. You can say, I know that person, but unless you spend time with them, do things together and share life together, you haven't experienced that person. You can say, I know someone, perhaps of the opposite sex, and you're interested in them or you're attracted to them. So you can say, I know them. But it's not until you have sexual intimacies, the Bible says then that you know them. In fact, interestingly enough, in the Hebrew language, it uses that terminology. Adam knew his wife Eve and conceived a son. See, you can know about God and not know God, not experience God. And communion in the Eucharist is all about experiencing God, not just knowing about him, not just celebrating communion in church because we do that every Sunday. Communion in the Eucharist is a precious time to experience God. Jesus is who God looks like. And if we see Jesus and we take what Jesus did and his instruction and we follow it, then we will experience God in a more direct, real way. Through this passage, we're told that faith in Jesus 
is eternal life. Faith is what spontaneously springs from my heart after I see Jesus with my spiritual eyes. The two men walking on the road to Emmaus. We've used this passage in Luke chapter 24. In our previous messages in this series, two men were walking along the road after the resurrection, talking about these things concerning the Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus suddenly appeared to them, and they didn't know who he was. He explained to them everything about the Christ and his, his coming, his death, burial, and resurrection while they were walking from the Old Testament, from the prophets, and they still, the Bible says, they still didn't recognize him. They couldn't see him. Is it possible, dear ones, that we have walked with Jesus for years and years? We know about him. We read the Bible, and so we get knowledge about God and Jesus but we haven't experienced Jesus. These two men were like that. They begged him to stay and have dinner. At dinner, Jesus broke bread, the Eucharist, handed it to them. Watch this. And it says, when he handed it to them and they took it and ate, then their eyes were opened. Something happens when we regularly celebrate communion or the Eucharist, something supernatural, you can know your Bible backwards and forwards and still not experience God in the way that he has for you to experience him. And the Eucharist celebrated weekly and celebrated at home. You can do it as often as you like is a doorway, if you will. It's a channel. It's a means by which we can take what is symbolized and God comes in that symbol and actually does what the symbol represents. So we see God. We have his presence. We stand face to face with him. We recognize Jesus. And faith then springs alive in our heart when we see Jesus. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I need to relax. You need to relax. His faith is enough. It's not my faith. It's his faith. So through the Eucharist, as we celebrate it, what we come to realize is that as we see Jesus, it's his faith that has saved us. It's his faith that keeps us. It's his faith that rises up within us all week long and supplies and brings us victory and causes us to be able to enter in to the blessing that he has for us. It's his faith, not my faith. But I have to see him and I see him through celebrating the Eucharist. That's when my eyes are opened. So Jesus says, I am the bread. I am the true bread. I am the manna that came from heaven. And he contrasts the manna of old with himself. And he says the manna of old couldn't change their lives. It didn't open their eyes. But I'm here to tell you that anybody that partakes of me, their eyes will be opened and they will have true life, eternal life. So Jesus is the fulfillment of what the manna only prophesied. Jesus becomes the fulfillment of what the manna pointed towards, that God wants a relationship with human beings. John chapter 6, verse 48 through 50. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died there in the wilderness. No change. Nothing different about their life. I've had people tell me, I've been a Christian for years. But it's kind of dead. There's nothing different. It doesn't really make a difference in my life. Well, that's entirely possible because you can read the Bible, you can go to church, and if your eyes aren't enlightened, if awareness doesn't come, 
It can just be dead ritual and you can die in the wilderness. Jesus continues, he says, this, what you have here standing with you face to face, is the very sustenance of your life. Talking about himself. Now, John chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ. So then Jesus introduces this radical teaching here in these verses that Carrie read that we have to take a step. That communion or the Eucharist is about taking an additional step or a further step with God. Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood. Can you see why they got angry at him? Can you see why they, <laughs> they said, man, this is too hard. I mean, just imagine if you walked into a church here in America today and from the pulpit they were talking about drinking blood and eating flesh and you had no context to it I wonder if you'd stick around these people are cannibals first church of the cannibal supper I, I mean I don't know what you what would you call first church of the cannibals and they flipped out. They said, what in the world is he talking about? You, you've got to eat his body and drink his blood. Well, he was talking about something spiritual. And we see that in verse 54. When he uses a word that talks about the continuous participation in the life of Christ. It's the Greek word hotrogon. It's in verse 54. It emphasizes ongoing habitual participation, participation in Christ's life. Not just going to church on Sunday. That doesn't do it. Not, not just reading your Bible and turning the pages. This is not a one-time event. This is a continual living, a continual happening in our lives every day. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. What Jesus was talking about is that communion or the Eucharist is a means for us to celebrate and have our eyes opened as happened to the two on the road to Emmaus. Not on that road, but at dinner that night. When Jesus broke bread, handed it to them, their eyes were open and suddenly they saw him. They recognized who he was. How long have you been walking in your spiritual life? How long have you been a Christian? Even reading your Bible, going to church and participating and feel like it's not really been life-changing. Feel like the experience of it is really lacking for you. Feel like Jesus is distant and you have to pray and ask him for favors. Why is that? It's because we don't understand our seamless union with Christ. Verse 56, you in me and I in you. That's the union. And that's what, that's what communion in the Eucharist brings alive for us, is that we are one in Christ through his flesh and blood. It's not a literal eating of flesh and blood. It's a spiritual partaking. But it's as powerful. It's as real. It's as present. It's as now. It is as... In fact, it's more real. It's more real than any bread you would eat or cup that you would drink. And our union with Christ is cemented through participating with his body in his blood, this sacramental imagery points to the spiritual connection that we have with Jesus. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, he can ask what he will, and it will be done for him by my Father who is in heaven. How is that? How is that possible that you can have that kind of prayer life? We must abide. How do you abide? partaking of his body and his blood. How do you do that? Well, one of the ways in which you do it, and the primary way, Jesus gave it to us when he celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. And he said, as often as you do this, 
You do it in remembrance of me, but you also make available to yourself this supernatural awareness, this opening of your eyes. I know because individuals have told me, even through the teaching of this series, this is hard to understand. I still don't get it. I'm not sure I understand how I'm one with Christ. I have a quote for you from Radine Williams, tremendous author, pastor, speaker. They're going to put it on the screen here for you. Radine Williams said this, we do not invoke his presence he captures our awareness. Stop praying for God to come to you. Stop asking God for his presence. Stop saying with your mouth, God isn't near to me. There's something missing I need to do to bring him. No, we don't invoke his presence. He captures our awareness. Let me show you something. Follow me, camera folks. Jesus, with those two disciples that were walking to the town called Emmaus, he stayed for dinner. They still didn't know who he was. The scripture says he broke the bread and he handed it to them. And they took and they ate. And then God captured their awareness. You don't need to pray that God would be closer to you. You don't need to pray and ask for God to come or to do a miracle. He's as close as he can possibly be. I am his temple. You are his dwelling place. What he does is he captures our awareness and and one of the ways he does that so powerfully is through the Eucharist so that we can be aware that we're one with him. We lack nothing. So why do I need to pray then? For your own understanding. To deal with your own difficulty being aware. Prayer helps me peel back the layers that are blocking awareness. Prayer doesn't get God to do things. Prayer releases me to be more aware of what he's already done. So I was meditating about, okay, well, what about sin and being forgiven? And I need to confess my sin and get forgiven and all of that. No, listen, sins are not atoned for or paid for. They're forgiven. They're just forgiven. The blood of Christ does not change God's mind. It changes my mind. The blood of Jesus, when I view it, when I read about it, when I drink from the cup, he captures, he captures my awareness. And all of a sudden I see with my spiritual eyes that I'm one with him, that his blood has conquered every darkness. I eat of the bread and suddenly I'm, I'm aware of what his body, broken, provides for me. And that sins are just forgiven through his mercy 
and his love, not because of a bloody sacrifice that I have to keep making over, or not because I ask over and over, forgive me, God, forgive me, God, forgive me, God. God doesn't forgive your sins because you ask. God forgives your sins because he loves you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. To see oneself associated in Christ's death and declared innocent in his blood is the only worthy manner in which to examine our life in the context of the new covenant meal, Eucharist. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. What faith? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. I implore you to examine faith for yourselves in order to test what it is that you really believe. Watch this. Faith is so much more than mere, the mere veneer of a superstitious belief in a historic Christ. Faith is about realizing Jesus Christ is in you in the midst of contradiction. There's so many contradictions. Doubts, fears, pains in your body, wars. You just lost your job. You were just fired. Oh my goodness. There's so many contradictions. And what faith does, not as a superstitious belief because I read it in a Bible, but because through communion, my awareness has been captured and I see Jesus. I see that I'm one with him. And so I rest. I relax. I don't have to figure out how to pray right. He prays for me. I don't have to figure out how to live a better life or how to be closer to God he is close to God for me and he lives in me and I can't get any closer to God than that we don't examine ourselves to see what's missing and then condemn and judge we examine ourselves to celebrate our oneness and what's already present within us we rejoice that his faith is enough. Jesus wasn't sacrificed by an angry God seeking a retribution for violating his holiness. Jesus didn't die to forgive our sins. Sins are washed or cleansed by mercy and love. Jesus died, number one, to demonstrate the love of God, and secondly, to conquer the powers of darkness. Look at this, Colossians chapter 2. In him, dying mankind's death, he diffused every possible claim of accusation against the human race and thus made a public spectacle of every rule and authority in God's brilliant triumph demonstrated in Jesus. The voice of the cross will never be silenced. I love the voice of the cross. Not because I have to try to do something to receive Jesus or be like Jesus, but because through the cross God demonstrated his love, number one, and number two, he's conquered all of death and hell's power. Francois Dutrois, the author of the Mirror Translation, says this, and we'll, we'll bring things to a close here. Watch. The horror of the cross is now the eternal trophy of God's triumph over sin. The cross stripped religion of its authority to manipulate mankind with guilt. Every accusation lost its leverage to blackmail the human race with condemnation and shame. You know what the Eucharist does is contrary to most religious systems where you and God are separated and you're bad and he's good and then there's things you have to do to get to him 
and they're never good enough. You never do them well enough. You never do enough of them. Works. <laughs> what Jesus did is he canceled all of that mess. And through the cross, he put every religious system to death, all of its requirements. And he says, here, come stand with me face to face. You say, I don't see him. I can't see him. There's too many things going on. Too much stuff in my head. Perfect. I have something for you. I call it the Eucharist. Communion. I, I can do no better than Jesus himself. He gave it to them that night. They ate it. And then their eyes were opened. I can do no better than to hand you the cup and say, here, drink. He arrests our attention. He captures our awareness and shows us who we are. Communion, the Eucharist, is an opportunity to come in with all of our stuff that's going on in our head, all of the layers of things that are blocking that face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus, and, and have them canceled. And through communion, this precious Eucharist, he captures my awareness. See, yeah, it doesn't last, however. I get out of here and I go home and I look at that stack of bills and I call so-and-so and they yell at me on the phone. And I go to work and my boss, you should see my boss. What a case. If you worked for my boss, you'd have troubles believing in Jesus too, Pastor Jeff. I know, we all have our stuff. And Jesus says, yeah, there's going to be contradictions. And that's why you come back to the precious blood and body. And Jesus said, eat, drink as often as you need to. Eat, drink. You say, I, 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 I don't always have this with me. What am I, what am I... It's a spiritual thing. Pull over on the side of the road. Pull over on the side of the road. Go, go buy a candy bar. Break it open. All right? A little grape juice out of the refrigerated section of 7-Eleven. Right? <laughs> I mean... It, it, it will help us to focus is what I'm talking about. You, you don't have to do this, but take it and say, Jesus, I know you're here. I know you're involved in my bills. I know you're involved with me when I get back off of lunch and I have to go face that employer or those individuals that I work with that are so difficult to work with. I, I, I know you're with me, and I'm going to celebrate that. Arrest my attention again, Holy Spirit. 